In the world of interactive short films and video, what are the examples that stand out above the rest? These interactive films combine traditional cinematography with interactive elements to have a powerful impact on people's lives. Hi there, it's Kimberly Go bringing you tips and tools to take interactive video to the next level. Today we're talking with award-winning director Martin Percy about interactive film and video. Martin's directed several interactive films that help people learn important skills like CPR, suicide prevention, and finding solutions to the global climate crisis. He's won numerous awards for his work, including an Emmy, a BAFTA, British Academy Award, six Webby Awards, and a Grand Clio. Let's jump into the conversation. Martin, I'm so glad that you're able to join us today. And I wanted to ask you about this phrase that you like to use called turn viewers into doers. And can you tell us how do effective films and videos accomplish this? Sure. So at one basic level, if you make an interactive film, you are turning viewers into doers. Because as you know, with a regular film, you don't have to do anything, right? You just sit there, you just view, you just watch. And for lots of films, of course, that's totally fine. I'm not suggesting for a moment that all films should be interactive. However, for some films, the makers of the film want the viewer to do something that they couldn't do afterwards. They want to change the viewer in some way. And if you want to do that, then interactive films are a very sort of powerful tool because in one obvious pedantic literal sense, you are turning a v the viewers into doers because they have to interact during the film in some way. But very often, the fact that you're making them do something equips them to do something else in real life. And so I've been lucky enough to get the chance to make films, for example, that teach people how to do CPR. Um, and there, within the film, you're not just watching, you're having to do something. And if you don't do anything, the guy in the film will die. But if you do do something, the guy in the film will survive. And by doing that in the film, medical research has proven that you are actually equipped to do things in real life because of what you've seen and done in the interactive film. Wow. So we're going to actually watch one of these uh, examples right now. Lifesaver is the one that uh, I'm going to start with. And you've got several. So we're going to uh, just begin with this one. Let me um, share my screen. Okay, you know what to do now, don't you? Excuse me, are you okay? Perhaps the first thing I should say about that clip is that is the first professional performance of Daisy Ridley from Star Wars. So if the woman in the film looks kind of familiar, that's why. Um, we were honoured to um, uh, find Daisy uh, there. That's about a year before she was cast in Star Wars. Um, and of course, she did an absolutely incredible job. Um, and, um, you know, um, so yes, it was a great honour to be able to work with her at that early stage. So Lifesaver includes several short films that cover CPR and basic life support skills. Can you share the research and stats on its effectiveness? Uh, when I made Lifesaver, I was working in collaboration with many other very talented people. Uh, I am not a doctor. I'm not an expert on CPR. Lifesaver was created in collaboration with the Resuscitation Council UK, which is the charity in the UK which decides the rules for how to do CPR. And it was a very brave move by them to back Lifesaver when I should say no one else would. So if you're thinking about a lot of other big 
sort of heart related charities that you might have thought would be a lot more likely to back it they said no <laughs> resuscitation council said yes and uh they did an absolutely fantastic job uh the other thing i should say is that uh, all the films you're going to see today i've created working with unit nine which is a digital production company sort of based in london but with offices all over the world and as an interactive filmmaker, I'm only able to do what I want to do because I'm fortunate enough to work with the super talented people at Unit 9. Now, you mentioned effectiveness. Lifesaver has been the subject of formal medical training. Uh, a group of doctors in the north of England uh, got a, a, a pool of school kids. Some of the school kids uh, were set to learn CPR using traditional face-to-face -face training with six kids for one trainer using plastic dummies. Another group of school kids learned CPR using Lifesaver just on an iPad with no plastic dummy involved in the training. They tested the kids immediately, then after three months and after six months. After six months, what they found was the kids who'd learned CPR just from Lifesaver on an iPad performed CPR 29% more effectively than the kids who'd learned CPR using the traditional, far more expensive face-to-face -face, uh, technique using plastic dummies with just six kids per trainer. Now, why was Lifesaver on an iPad more effective? No one really knows. There's, you know, the research didn't really go that far, but there's one obvious reason which is that with lifesaver we're using the emotional power of live action film to recreate a the 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 panic of an emergency situation and then we're adding interactivity to make it so that you have to keep on thinking and making good decisions all the way through that that simu that crisis simulation and so that makes something which is very emotionally gripping and of course, if something is emotionally gripping, then it's memorable. And so we believe that the reason for this huge uptake in effectiveness is because the kids were really gripped by what they saw playing Lifesaver. And that's why six months later, they were able to remember it. Lifesaver is an interactive video or film that works on a desktop computer, but it also works on mobile devices. And how is the experience different in those different uh, environments, the interactive experience? Sure. So the key difference is how you do CPR. And obviously with a CPR training film, how you do CPR is the heart of the experience. And it really was designed for mobile devices, for phones and tablets. And with the mobile version of Lifesaver, we use the accelerometer in the mobile device. So that what you do is you, you first you know, you're, you're navigating through, you're answering questions to get to the CPR, just like you do on a desktop. But then when it comes to doing CPR, you have to move your device up and down two times a second. And as you do that, you see on the device, the victim, the real live victim. And if you do the, um, the CPR at the correct speed, then the victim will survive. If you do it too fast or too slow, then the victim will die. Wow. And so it's obviously, it's very, very simple, right? And people say, well, but how can that possibly be effective? The medical research using an iPad shows that it is effective, that we teach people how to put their hands in a sort of step-by-step -step way. You know, it's like, do you, put, do you bend your arms? Do you have your arms straight? Da, 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 da. We sort of go through that step-by-step. -step. So the process of telling people a correct hand position and correct arm position, we handle with interactive choices. So then once you're all set up and once your character in the film is all set up to do the CPR properly, that's when we then move into the accelerometer and that is giving the sense of speed. Um, and indeed the medical research found that the speed that uh, kids did CPR at was accurate. So overall it worked. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I think that that physicalness of it is what probably makes the, the learning become embodied in the person Absolutely. as opposed to just a theoretical uh, learning. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's wonderful. But it is available on all these different platforms. Um, and yes. it's a free yes. app. 
Is that correct? It's completely free. Yes, it's uh, free. Yes. Yep. So I want to show now um, a clip from Heart Class, which is a different style of, it's something similar, but different. What would you do now? Put Mr. Ryan on his side? Or try to get him to respond to you? Respond. Good. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan, are you okay? It made me feel like I could actually save somebody. That was incredible. What did the research show about the effectiveness of heart class? Sure. So we looked at Lifesaver and we saw that that's available on computer, on phone and on iPad. Now, why is that no use for schools? The answer is we're doing three different types of device, but they are all designed as a one person, one device medium. And in schools, that doesn't work because schools, you've got 30 kids, one teacher, one computer. Yes, of course, I realize that most of the kids have probably got at least one mobile phone in their pocket, but the teachers don't want to get those mobile phones out because they know it'll just turn into a TikTok festival. Uh, so the teachers want something that can run just off one computer for everyone in the classroom. And so Heart Class was a, um, so Heart Class was an initiative at showing how we could take the same basic approach into CPR training, but do it on one computer, one teacher, 30 kids. So I, with Heart Class, I was lucky enough to collaborate with uh, Dr. Laurel Toft, who is a very eminent researcher into the use of CPR training in schools in the United States. If you Google sort of facts and figures about CPR training in the US, half the time you'll end up finding that you're actually reading research that Laurel has done. So she was a fantastic person to work with on this because she's unusual in that she's a very distinguished um, emergency room physician who also takes the time to do training and so she is skilled at both ends of the spectrum mm. so uh we got together uh with laurel to make heart class um, and heart class was tested in louisville kentucky uh with 600 students and they uh test they took half the students doing heart class half the students did the top of the line commercially available classroom teaching for CPR. So that's a ready to go pack, which has got a DVD with linear videos in and other such aids. Uh, and they tested the 300 kids using these two techniques. They tested them immediately, three months later and six months later. After six months, they found that the kids who'd learned CPR with heart class performed CPR 47% more effectively than the kids who had learned from the top of the line traditional classroom teaching technique. Wow, that's pretty impressive. I believe heart class won an Emmy this last year. Is that correct? Uh, we were very happy that it won an Emmy uh, and, you know, that sort of award is, you know, just a nice kind of bonus uh, but obviously the real win was 47 percent greater effectiveness than traditional uh, classroom teaching yeah wonderful all right so we also have a you've done some work with uh, vr with heart class and i want to show one of those clips next lifesaver vr is an interactive vr film for teenagers where you have to save someone's life by making smart choices and doing CPR. I think having it in VR makes a difference because you feel much more like you're in the situation and like it depends on you rather than just being told or watching it on TV. At the start of Lifesaver VR, a group of friends are relaxing when one of them, Harry, collapses with a cardiac arrest. He will be dead in 10 minutes unless you Harry. do the right thing. What would you do? Run to help Harry now or check for danger first? Watch out for the glass! 
You interactively control the actions of Harry's friend Chloe as she tries to save him. The film experiments with different forms of VR. This first half is shot like a regular film, but you watch it in VR cinema mode on your headset. Call an ambulance! The phone's in there. No, he's just as mobile. What? You make choices by turning your head to put a red circle over the option that you think is right. Exactly. He might choke. In the second half of the film, you have to make more choices and do CPR. For this, we go into full 360 video. You have to push down hard two times a second. Your headset senses your movements and gives you feedback. Doing it in VR, I felt like I was doing it myself, whereas in a video, somebody else is doing it. There was one point when I thought there was no hope, so I thought I was going to cry. No, I have to do it! <laughs> if you make the wrong decisions, or your CPR speed is bad, then Harry will die. He's breathing normally, he's waking up! But if you do the right thing, you'll sense the thrill of saving a life. Lifesaver VR uses virtual reality to put teenagers into the world of a film and change that world. And it gives them the skills to save others in real life. Now I feel like I have enough confidence to go over and do something. When you do it yourself, you become really, really happy because you just saved that person's life. VR obviously is a very powerful experience, um, but you don't need to have VR in order for this kind of emergency uh, training to be effective, right? That's right. So VR, as you say, is a very powerful medium, but like all media, it's got its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, and we've never had formal medical research about Lifesaver VR in the way that we have done with Heart Plus and Lifesaver for flat screens. But to be honest, the data that we've had so far doesn't suggest that Lifesaver VR is actually necessarily all that more, much more effective than the flat screen version. You know, that people see films in their mind's eye. And if you are captivated by a film, you are in the experience. And the ability to sort of turn your head around and see the wall over here and the wall over here is not necessarily going to add that much to your sense of immersion. Um, it can, but uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the problem is that there's an obvious weakness with VR, which is distribution, that not enough people have got headsets. Uh, even once they have headsets, what kind of headsets are they? How good are they? And so on. So um, I'm by no means a sort of evangelist for VR. I mean, it's a fascinating medium. It has some huge strengths, but it also has some really significant weaknesses. Uh, in the case of Lifesaver VR, of course, what we were able to do was, as you could see in the trailer, create a situation where essentially people built their own set before the film begins, we tell you to get a cushion and you start doing a little bit of a practice doing CPR on that cushion before you put your headset on. And then we say, okay, once you're all comfortable, you put the headset on and then off you go. Uh, and um, that works well. And certainly we are getting people into something which is much closer to a correct physical position for for doing um, VR. Hey, if you're getting value from this video, could you hit that like button to let me know? And be sure to subscribe and ring the notification bell to see more content like this. Okay, let's get back to the conversation. So in that sense, that's a great strength of Lifesaver VR. But on the other hand, there's the problem of the distribution. You know, people still don't have the headsets. And so uh, one thing that often happens is that people are aware that there's Lifesaver and Lifesaver VR. And when we talk about the Lifesaver research, they assume that we're talking about Lifesaver VR. Because there's uh, one issue which I call the shiny object syndrome, <laughs> that some people think that to get innovation, you need a shiny object. One of the things that we're saying with interactive film is that you, we can have these huge increases in effectiveness without a new shiny object. 
it's just your same phone that you've been using for the last three years. It's the same computer you've had sitting in the corner for the last 10 years, but we can do so much more with it. We don't need a new shiny object. We don't need people to rush out and buy a new device like a VR headset in order to get innovation. We can get innovation with the devices that we already have. And that's one of the real lessons of the Lifesaver research. Yeah, that's, that's really important. I think the practicality of being able to do interactive video or interactive film nowadays um, and have it be effective is really more important than having the next cool device. Um, you had done an interactive video about suicide prevention. That was a very powerful one called Real Talk About Suicide. And I want to show that clip now. I, I just feel a bit worthless, mate. And, and I, I just think, um, I, I do think it'd be, it, they'd be better off without me. It sounds like Chris might be thinking about suicide. So what now? Yes. Ask a direct question using the word suicide. That's the best way to get a clear response. Saying the word suicide will not put the idea into Chris's head. So it's best to ask directly. You say you think you're a loser and you think the world would be better off without you. Is that, are you thinking about suicide? Mate, what do you care? Why, why does it matter to you? You actually know me. Woody, are you thinking about killing yourself? I think about it all the time. I can't stop thinking about it. I just need this to stop. Can you tell me more about it? Mate, I just feel... broken. I can't sleep. I am... Uh, you know, like, I hate myself for feeling like this because I know... I know compared to some people, but... it just, um... Nothing seems to matter. And, and I need it to stop. Because I am so tired. I genuinely... I just... I just don't see the point anymore. Yes, you're right. But now here's a question about Chris. Does he really want to die? Exactly. Many suicidal people don't really want to die. They just feel trapped and want the pain to stop. And they can't see any other way out. That interactive film is very powerful. It's a very emotional experience. Can you tell us about how that film came about? Sure. So uh, we made Lifesaver and it was seen by a wide range of people, including some people at a tiny suicide prevention charity in Brighton, England called Grassroots Suicide Prevention. They got in touch with me uh, and they found out more about Lifesaver and they saw about the effectiveness uh, that the medical researcher demonstrated with the Lifesaver approach. And they decided that they wanted that level of effectiveness with suicide prevention. Now, this was a, a bold move on their part, because the thing is that CPR, obviously, there are many psychological factors involved in successfully doing CPR. But fundamentally, it's, you know, you stick your hands together, you keep your arms straight, and you just bang away on the person's chest until the paramedics arrive or someone gets an AED. So there's a sort of brutal simplicity about CPR, which there is clearly not when it comes to the topic of how to talk to someone with suicidal feelings about those feelings. 
Uh, and so it was great that Grassroots um, wanted to do that. And I think the feedback that they've had has been extremely positive. And it's extremely rare also to have a charity really reach out to try to give ordinary people the tools to do that sort of thing. But if you look at the world of suicide prevention training, there's a lot of very expensive professional training courses which you do, of course, if that's if you're going to become a counselor or so on, something. But of course, most people don't want to blow five hundred dollars on a weekend learning how to be a suicide uh, count, counselor. Uh, it's very rare to have this sort of initiative, which is trying to teach normal people what to do if they find themselves in a difficult situation. And of course, one of the things we're telling is, you know, contact experts. You know, get in touch with charities in the UK we have a charity called the Samaritans and that's one of the things that you learn in real talk about suicide is to try to hook the person up with the Samaritans and so on um, but but the the key initiative that grassroots suicide prevention were trying to do was to try to put the power to change someone's mind into the hands of regular people and so far i believe they think it's been very successful wow. yeah so i'm going to include links to this and all of the other resources that we're talking about in the show notes below i've also uh, recently directed an interactive film about the global climate crisis and we're going to watch that clip now This isn't a normal film. We'll be asking you questions all the way through. And here's the first one. How much hotter is the world now than it was in 1880? Two degrees. Two, Two degrees. degrees. No, I'm happy to say that's not right. Have another go. One degree. One degree. One degree. One degree. One degree. You're right. We've got weather data stretching back to the 1880s. This was the world back then. The film is great and I like that it's really interactive. I didn't realise that at the beginning. But it's just, you know, when you see all of those images combined, it's so scary. When you have it all condensed down into a five minute segment, it's kind of like... Pfft. Let's talk about your point of view. What would you vote for to tackle the climate emergency? Political, Political system change. Democratic approach. I think I would say definitely have a systemic change first. I tend to consider technology somehow part of the problem. Um, it seems like the technocratic approach. So this was an online group activity and the interactivity here was more discussion based. Um, what were the benefits of choosing this kind of interactive format? We've all seen political documentaries of one sort or another. So if you say, take a movie like Bowling for Columbine, say Michael Moore's film. And so you have this film played in a cinema, you know, that's where I saw, saw it certainly. And you would have lots of people turn up and they probably only turned up because they already agreed with the basic point of view that was going to be shown in the film. And the film would go on and on and on and make you more and more angry until you had like steam pouring out of your ears. You were so sort of enraged about the wickedness that you were seeing on screen. And then the film would end. And then everyone would go home and they might share it on social media or they might not. Uh, and that's the model of the classic political documentary. And it seems to me that this is just not, fit for purpose anymore that political movements are not just about you know one person or one group of people sort of saying x and everyone listening silently and receiving that political movements should be about about a conversation should be about all of us together working out what we think and 
that was the the nucleus of the idea for Climate Emergency Interactive. Now, I was lucky enough to make Climate Emergency Interactive uh, in collaboration with a group of students and staff at University of the Arts London, which is the largest arts university in Europe and uh, has many people who are very passionate about the climate emergency. And so we created it as a, as a, a way to discuss ideas about climate change and create a sort of a common platform for thinking about climate change for the students at University of the Arts London. Uh, I should say that 45% of the students at UAL are not just not from the UK, they're not from Europe. So, so huge numbers of students there are from China or India, um, where it's very unusual to be taught about climate change in any detail at school. So we don't really know what they think about it. And so that's where we try to discuss things with them. And Climate Emergency Interactive kind of works in two ways. We have four films. In each film, there are questions that you answer. Some of the questions are about facts. Some of the questions are about political opinions. And some of the questions are about determination and resolution. And each of those films then leads to a discussion period where people are completely free to say anything they want. And so the, the interaction during the film, which is all done by voice, by shouting out, it's never done by just kind of pressing a button. The interaction by voice during the film kind of warms people up as sort of shallow, easy interactivity for the more challenging, demanding interactivity of actually expressing your opinions in a forum with other people. So what we have is a way to discuss and share political ideas, which is not just kind of broadcasting, you know, from the dot top to the masses, but rather is about trying to um, uh, get people on board, making sure they think, making sure they know the facts, understanding what their political opinions are, um, understanding what they are determined to do, and then letting them share those views and discuss those views and debate those views in an open, honest way. So Martin, you, uh, your films are different than traditional films. In traditional films, they're, they're pretty much just telling a story. Um, how is this interactive film, interactive video medium different? Well, that's a great question, Kimberly, and that takes us to the heart of how I believe you can make an interactive film powerful, as opposed to being dreadful, which is what a lot of interactive films are. Um, the key thing is to understand the nature of story, and obviously the vast majority of stories are not interactive. But real life is always interactive. So when I'm thinking about making a film, I don't start with a story. What I start with is a bit of real life and I'm trying to make a model of it with film and interactivity. And if you think about it in that way, then the interactive handles become much more obvious. So an obvious example is Lifesaver, right? So it's, I never think about it, I never describe it as a story about someone who has a heart attack where you try to reach a happy end. Because as soon as you start thinking about that, you will just break it in your mind and it will, you'll start thinking, well, but the story needs to do this. How am I gonna do that? Don't think about it like that. It's a model of real life. It's kind of like, you are really there and you are trying to save this person who's having a cardiac arrest. And the things that you do in the film are the things that you would do in real life. Now you might say, okay, well, fine. Well, that's obvious with something like Lifesaver or Real Talk About Suicide. But what about the climate emergency film? That's not a recreation of a specific, ex specific event, which is true. However, uh, what we were modeling in Climate Emergency Interactive was were the sort of political events that you often find in the climate 
movement where you have these events where people get together and someone will talk about the climate emergency and then people will break up into groups and they will discuss what they think and then they will share what they think with the wider group. So what we were trying to do with Climate Emergency Interactive was really build a model of that using film and interactivity and of course we hope make something far more powerful and far more effective uh, than the original um, but the basic principle is to try to build on that real life event as our starting point because if you're starting with something in real life then it's far easier to get the emotional connection working. It's far easier to make something where when people see it, it just feels simple and obvious. And yes, of course, this is how you should teach CPR. Yes, of course, this is how you should discuss the climate emergency. And it feels simple and obvious because it's based on real life. It's mm -hmm. not based on a story. Wow, that is powerful stuff. I love the fact that this work is, this medium is grounded in reality. I mean, I, I feel like that's that's really where so much of the power, is. And, and as you said, that emotional response that people have, it's, 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 that is also grounded in reality and thus is more likely to play out in real life later. Martin, this has been a fabulous conversation. If thank people you. would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Well, uh, thank you, Kimberly. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for the great questions and the very, sort of perceptive comments. Uh, if people want to get in touch, please do get in touch. Probably the easiest way is LinkedIn. Just search for me, Martin Percy on LinkedIn and uh, um, we can get together that, like that. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm gonna include Martin's contact information in the show notes as well. Thank you. This has been a great conversation, Martin. I'm so Absolutely. glad that you were able to join us and I, I hope that we'll be able to chat again soon. I hope so too, Kimberly. That's been great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, smash the like button to let me know and hit subscribe to see more content like this as soon as it's uploaded. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.